Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the ANU Energy Change Institute's public forum, which will be discussing the uh, technology investment roadmap this afternoon. And uh, we've called this Digging Deeper into the Technology Investment Roadmap. And we'll be looking at the, uh, the recently released uh, first low emissions technology statement, uh, which uh, you can see. Uh, that uh, has a uh, series of uh, important uh, priorities and recommendations and we'll be discussing this in more detail in a minute. But uh, let me just uh, start off the proceedings uh, by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Professor Ken Baldwin. I'm the Director of the Energy Change Institute here at the Australian National University. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose lands we meet, uh, in my case, the Ngunnawal people, and uh, would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, please note that this is a public forum and that indeed media are present. And uh, I'll outline the running order of the proceeding shortly. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, I'd like to ask you to think of questions that you can ask uh, later in the in the proceedings, uh, which you can do by writing your question in the Q&A window uh, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can uh, adjust your window settings to use your name or you can ask a question anon anonymously. Uh, we'll see if we can get through all the questions today, uh, but if we do run out of time, uh, we welcome your questions via email until Monday and we will endeavour to follow all of them up. So let me just very quickly uh, introduce the panel. I'll introduce them in more detail as we uh, proceed with the presentations. Uh, just to let you know that uh, we'll be starting the proceedings by our keynote talk presented by Australia's Chief Scientist, Dr. Alan Finkel. And this will be followed by some perspectives presented by our discussion panel, which includes Dr. Patrick Hartley, leader of CSIRO's Hydrogen Industry Mission, Dr. Liz Ratnam, a future engineering research leader fellow in the ANU College of Engineering and Computer Science, Associate Professor Llewellyn Hughes from the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy, and Anna Scarbeck, CEO of Climateworks Australia. So Dr. Finkel will give his presentation about the uh, roadmap for about half an hour and each of the panelists will then speak for five minutes before we move to Q&A from the audience. Uh, just before we be begin, I'd like to flag that this will be the first of two ANU webinars about the Technology Investment Roadmap. Uh, the second will be on Monday the 12th of October at 5.30 p.m. Uh, where the ANU Climate Change Institute will look at some of the climate specific aspects of the roadmap. So this includes things like carbon capture and use as an emerging technology and uh, in particular the soils uh, science aspects of the roadmap. Uh, we'll put a link in the chat about that so you have a direct uh, uh, link to attend that meeting on Monday as well. So it's now my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Alan Finkel. Uh, Dr. Finkel commenced as Australia's chief scientist. Now, I guess, uh, Alan, uh, uh, five years ago, almost. Uh, and uh, as Australia's uh, eighth chief scientist, uh, he was uh, also prior to his appointment, uh, the president of ATSI, the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, and for eight years was chancellor of Monash University. Uh, since taking on the role of Chief Scientist uh, back in January 2020, uh, Dr. Finkel uh, was uh, uh, part of the, uh, sorry, uh, was appointed in January 2020 as a chair of the expert advisory panel for CSIRO's report on climate and disaster resilience. And in February 2020, he was appointed as chair of the Technology Investment Roadmap Ministerial Reference Group. Uh, he's also led the development of the 2019 National Hydrogen Strategy, which was adopted in November 2019, uh, with, I believe, a, a complete uh, adoption of all the uh, key elements. He was also uh, the uh, person who led the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap in 2016, the 2017 review into the national electricity market, and the 2018 STEM Industry Partnership Forum report. 
so clearly no stranger to uh, talking about things technology. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Dr. Alan Finkel to present the keynote presentation this afternoon. Alan. Thank you, Ken, for those introductory words. Much appreciated. It's been a strange year and actually a lot of my work this year has been to do with COVID-19 with uh, the response earlier in the year for uh, intensive care ventilators and now contact tracing and outbreak management, all of which can benefit from science and also the engineering method. Um, Ken, I'm going to share my screen. Is that the plan? Please go ahead. So, Okay, so can you see the screen pivoting to the future? Yes, that looks good. Great. Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you about the low emissions technology statement, which is an element of the overarching uh, technology roadmap that the government has been focusing on and introduced recently. So I think I can put it to you that Australia is on a journey and the direction of its journey is changing in recent years into a sunnier future. There's truly been a lot of activity. Um, of course, if you go back quite a number of years, we've had the Renewable Energy Target, which was pivotal in terms of setting us on a road to a cleaner electricity supply, although there's still a long way to go. Uh, we had the National Energy and Productivity Plan, which I'll just call the Efficiency Plan. I'm showing you these little road marks along the highway the future, uh, the Climate Solutions Fund, which is the Emissions Reduction Fund as well. Um, there's a critical minerals strategy, which builds our capacity to one day um, build uh, batteries and, and motors and other critical elements of a low emissions future. The review that I did in 2017 of the electricity market that Ken mentioned was actually quite important for two reasons. One is it made sure that our system had the connection requirements correct so that large-scale wind and solar could connect to the grid, ride out storms and be a team player. And it also um, put in the requirement for the integrated system plan that AEMO has put out uh, twice now, the integrated system plan, which will enable, does enable us and will enable us to ship electrons north and south, east and west, and also open up the renewable energy zones. And as Ken mentioned, we had the national hydrogen strategy adopted last year by every state and territory. It really should be called the national clean hydrogen strategy because hydrogen <coughs> made with non-clean methods, the hydrogen itself, of course, is always clean, but hydrogen made from non-clean methods has been around for a long time with the future focus is all on clean hydrogen. And what we're going to talk about today is the low emissions technology statement, which allows me to finish the sentence in the title there, Australia is on a journey to a low emissions future. Long way to go, but the journey has begun. So I'm going to talk today specifically about the low emissions technology statement. Now, it's important to understand that um, there are two ways that reviews can be done for government. Um, something like the electricity review that I did in 2017, that was done as an independent review where we developed our recommendations and effectively tossed them back over the fence to government for government to decide whether they would accept or reject the recommendations. And it's quite well known, 49 out of 50 uh, were accepted and uh, most of those have already been acted upon. But this review is more like the National Hydrogen Strategy where the, the low emissions technology statement is actually owned by government, but it benefited from deep and uh, well-connected advice from an advisory panel uh, that was advising Minister Angus Taylor in the development of this. So it's his, it's the government's report. So if you look at it, and I hope that you have, and if you haven't, I hope, then I hope that you will, you'll see that there are no recommendations in there. What there are are statements of government actions, in many cases, funded actions. So it's quite different. It goes out and it's already got the support of government. So as I said, they were advised by a panel called the Ministerial Reference Panel that I chaired. I had six invited members. I won't go through one by one their names, but you can see them clearly there um, covering areas of industrial logistics supply, research capability, uh, clean investment, um, the use of hydrogen pipelines and policy. 
But going forward, the minister has decided that the panel, which was intended as a one-time panel, um, that it should effectively morph into a long-term panel. It'll get a new name. It's um, flagged in the, in the statement at the Technology Investment Advisory Council. And we're bringing in three ex officio members, David Parker, the chair of the Clean Energy Regulator, well, it's, it's really the chair who happens to be, for example, of ARENA, Justin Punch, but it's an ex officio position, so it's always the chair uh, of ARENA and the chair of the Green Bank, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. So the existing seven members, myself and the other six, are continuing in this permanent advisory council with three additional people being brought in uh, in an ex officio capacity. And, and I'm remaining as the chair. We went into this uh, development of our advice to the minister with some principles in mind. And I think these are important to articulate. They were with us from the beginning, they've been with us throughout, and they will endure into the ongoing work of the Technology Investment Advisory Council. The first, the report was not about climate change. We all accept the science of climate change is absolutely proven. It's not in dispute. and the language of government has changed as of effectively in my mind january this year uh, there's no argument the prime minister the energy minister are basically accepting that we have to do our bit to responsibly respond to the implications the very serious implications of climate change uh, that means of course that the world must reduce emissions and australia has to be part of that effort to reduce emissions as quickly as is practically possible. And the third principle is that it's not just about reducing emissions, we have to do so while maintaining our prosperity. We want to have our cake and eat it too, if you like. Uh, Unusually for a government report, there's a clearly articulated vision statement in this report. The vision statement is that we look forward to a prosperous Australia recognised as a global low emissions technology leader. In other words, we want economic prosperity and we want to lower emissions and have a leadership role in doing that. There are below the vision strategic intents that are intended to help deliver that vision. There are four key ones. Um, we want lower household living expenses because all Australians should benefit from abundant, clean, and very importantly, low cost energy. And that's one of the, um, the, the fruit of solar and wind electricity at large scale. We recognize the importance of an ongoing research effort in order to be able to deliver these important outcomes. And so one of our strategic intents is to set up a research infrastructure that will attract and retain the best minds, in particular in long emissions research. We want to see Australia be very competitive internationally by leveraging on our comparative advantages, in particular um, our low cost and abundant solar and wind, and to some extent hydroelectric renewable energy. And of course, the government is very focused on preserving and creating jobs. So we need to capture the opportunities that will deliver on those jobs going forward. When we started, and actually before I was involved, the Department of Energy working with the CSIRO and ARENA developed a list of about 140 technologies, which we had to categorize. And we've ended up categorizing those technologies into four big groups. The first is what we call the priority low emissions technologies. They're so important in our opinion that the government just needs to invest in order to bring these forward as quickly as possible. So they are co cost effective low emissions solutions for the country. The second is what we call emerging and enabling technologies. So they could be enabling technologies such as aspects of the operation of the national electricity market that enable the low emissions, the priority low emissions technologies to operate effectively. Or they could be new technologies that are getting close to being at the point where 
government and industry should uh, be piling on and investing in them, but they're not quite there yet, but a lot of serious potential. And those are the ones that ARENA and the CFC and um, the CER uh, will look at supporting. There are other technologies that we recognize as having what we've called transformative potential, but they're just not ready yet for the kind of um, attention that a Commonwealth government would want to deliver. And the fourth is not the continuum, it's a step away from the priority emerging and watching brief technologies. It's just to acknowledge that there are mature technologies that the government is not planning to invest in. And they, of course, the mature uh, fossil fuel technologies, but also uh, the, we're saying that at this stage, solar and wind and hydroelectricity uh, are not, at, in the case of solar and wind, at the end of their journey, but the volume and the traffic in solar and wind in Australia and globally is such that private industry without ongoing support is already effectively in the money and able to deliver ongoing improvements in those technologies without um, a specific government investment. And those mature technologies, solar and wind in particular, are key in the way that they support the priority low emissions technologies that I'll talk about soon. So I mentioned that we had 140 and we had to make selections. What did we have in mind when we selected those priority technologies? And I, I wanna focus on the priority technologies from now on. Well, the there were four filters. And the first was that we only wanted to have the Commonwealth government uh, giving its attention to technologies that have large abatement potential that can seriously reduce carbon dioxide, or let me expand and say greenhouse gas emissions in Australia and in our exported products. So large abatement potential is key. They also have to have large economic impact. There's got to be something that can be delivered um, for their abatement potential, but also for their contribution to the prosperity of Australia. Ideally, they're technologies that are not just brought in from overseas, but to the extent that they're brought in from overseas, we also can add to them and build on our, on our comparative advantages so that we have a competitive position. And finally, they've got to be technologies where it actually makes a difference if the government gives them some attention or not. So what are those five priority technologies? Well, the first is clean hydrogen um, as described in the National Hydrogen Strategy, but through the Low Emissions Technology Strategy, the government is gonna give even, even more attention and funding to the development of a variety of uh, clean hydrogen uh, pathways strategies. For example, there was funding announced, um, I think $50 million for, a, uh, for the commencement of a hydrogen hub in the strategy was identified that to get the threshold in demand to justify building production at a level that will lower the costs, um, we pretty much have to do things in a, a aggregated form through hubs. Uh, the second is looking at how batteries and pumped hydro and solar thermal uh, can contribute the storage capability that will enable us to bring more solar and wind into the electricity system as quickly as possible. Uh, the third is actually two things, but it's really, we call it one because it's zero emissions metals, but specifically we're looking at zero emissions aluminium and zero emissions steel. Now these are not easy to do, but we think that the impact is huge, the, the abatement potential is enormous. And with government investment, working with industry and investors, we believe that these can be developed for uh, the long-term benefit of Australia and Australians. Um, now, it doesn't matter how well we do with the first three and other low emissions technologies, there's always gonna be some sectors of our economy that are reducing emissions and so there's a need at the end of the day as we go through the coming years and decades there's going to be a need to be able to effectively mop up what we can't eliminate and there are two ways to do that one is 
geo sequestration and specifically carbon capture and storage. And the other is bio sequestration. And there are different ways of doing that. You can be above ground or below ground. Um, we felt that there's a lot of opportunity for below ground storage of carbon that's absorbing carbon dioxide out of the air and turning it into organic matter of long duration in the soil. But to do that effectively needs an investment from government to develop low cost measurement techniques, because unless you can measure it, you don't know that it's really there. Unless you can do that measurement inexpensively, it's just not practical for farmers to invest in. Now with each of these, and I won't go through every single one of them, there's an economic stretch goal. So for example, for hydrogen, through a you know, a careful process of investigating the market opportunities, we've identified that if hydrogen can be produced for less than $2 per kilogram, less than $2 Australian per kilogram, then it starts to become competitive with the high emissions incumbent. Clean hydrogen, $2 a kilogram, can easily substitute for uh, petrol and diesel, for transport, whether it's small cars, large cars, trains, or ships. And when I'm talking about hydrogen, I'm also talking about hydrogen derivatives, such as ammonia, which could be, and a lot of people are thinking this, the clean fuel for the international maritime fleet, the ships that plough the waters between the continents. So there's an economic stretch goal for all of those five priority technologies, or the six if you split out solar, uh, aluminium, steel, where we think that the, well, we know that the low emissions technology that we're supporting will be cost competitive with the high emissions incumbent and effectively make the high emissions incumbent obsolete because economically rational actors will choose the inexpensive low emission new contender. Um, the government is willing to spend money to make this happen, but it absolutely expects that the uh, industry and investors will pile in if they're given the right signals. And based on experience with ARENA and the CFC in the past, the government is hoping that it's, its investment of money and signals will catalyze between three and five dollars of investment from the private sector per dollar of government investment. And, and the minister has already declared that the government is committed to $18 billion of ongoing investment over the years this decade. If that brings in um, co-investment at the three to five dollars um, per dollar rate, you're talking up to $100 billion of investment into low emissions technologies by the government and private um, investors this decade. There might be more. This is a fabulous starting position. And part of that $18 billion is a commitment of around $1.5 billion for ARENA for the next 10 years. So it's a, it's a shot in the arm. It's life for ARENA because uh, its funding was about to run out. So that's really exciting to see that. Um, I won't go through the details, but the government has declared four areas that it will um, monitor its own performance and the performance of investment community. So investment incentive framework uh, would include investment uh, into research and development all the way through to pre-commercialization or early stage commercial uh, deployment. Uh, legislative and regulatory reforms um, will uh, identify where there are barriers to adoption of hydrogen and other new low emissions technologies. Institutions and governance is referring to working with the clean energy agencies such as ARENA and CFC to ensure that they've got the remit to invest in a spectrum of low emissions uh, technologies and also to require that they report on a regular more regular basis, more frequent basis to government on their progress um, in developing these low emissions technologies. And the monitoring transparency and impact evaluation column at the right there is touching on the fact that there's an intention to produce a low emissions technology statement update every year. And that will involve monitoring how things are progressing and adapting um, our policy circumstances to optimize the pathway forward from each year onwards. Now, a lot of people have asked me about investment certainty. A lot of people said, Alan, investors are upset, but there's no investment certainty. I'll show you investment certainty. That's a picture of the main building of the Bank of England. 
That's where investors get certainty. If you want certainty as an investor, you invest in a bank. What it's, it's investors in, in um, technology or industry, <clears throat> transport or whatever are not looking for certainty, but they are looking for clarity. And I believe that we're giving that to them. So we can't, the government can't give certainty to investors. As I said, that's the responsibility of the bank. But what we can do is give policy direction. Uh, the investment community knows now that the government will be investing of, of, of the order of $2 billion a year into low emissions technologies going forward. Um, there's awareness that there'll be an annual review and that's a good thing because we need to refine policy going forward. But it's very clear in the low emissions technology statement that there's no intention of right angle turns or U-turns. We're talking about fine tuning what we believe is existing good policy so that it captures the advancements that occur year by year. And also the government is signaling and providing policy direction through where it's investing R&D dollars and the early commercialization support. I, I think I, I could say that the uh, issue of investment certainty is a myth that needs to be dispelled. A few other myth buster type things. So yes, we've been asked, oh my gosh, you know, you're got priority technologies there for you're picking a winner. And I personally don't have a problem with picking winners, but a lot of people do. But in fact, this is not picking a winner. What we have here is a portfolio of five or six key technologies, which is spreading the risk. And that's what any sensible big company would do in its um, R&D portfolio. Um, the key commonality is that this portfolio is focused on technologies that will reduce atmospheric emissions. The outcome that we're pursuing here is not a technology outcome. Ultimately, the outcome that we're pursuing here is lowering emissions into the atmosphere. I'm constantly or frequently asked, you know, why are we putting out a statement about gas? and the role of gas going to the future. Well, this statement's not about gas. If, if people actually sit down and read it, gas basically doesn't get a mention. This is about using batteries and, and pumped hydro and thermal storage to support more and more solar and wind electricity into the grid and into off-grid applications as quickly as possible. It's about developing a capacity to produce zero emission steel. It's about developing a clean hydrogen industry. And I will note that in parentheses, you're right, that is a gas, but I don't think they had that in mind when they were asking me about gas. Uh, there's concern that there isn't an overarching target, but there are sub-targets. So we have the stretch goals for the five key priority technologies. And so they give us our near-term goals, which are driving us down the pathways to a low emissions future. And if we do it well, as I've said before, and it's written here, will achieve cost parity so that the new low emissions technology will actually be adopted en masse because they will be outcompeting the high emissions technology, the incumbents. And finally, there's concern that CCS is mentioned, but if you read it, it's and, and look at the funding behind it, it's a, it's a the funding is a small element. It's about $50 million out of the roughly $2 billion that has been committed. Um, and it's not addressing coal-fired electricity. Um, anything's possible, but the, the intention here is to ensure that we have the capability, uh, the resources and the skills on hand to use CCS where it makes sense for mopping up residuals. And we're not alone. If you look at the United Nations IPCC report, they talk about the need for CCS and CCUS in order to reach net zero by 2050, or actually they're talking about reaching net zero in the second half of the century. The International Energy Agency, which is uh, really has the membership of, of most of the countries in the world, also talks about the importance of CCS because there will always be emissions from hard to abate sectors that have to be sequestered either through biosequestration or through geosequestration. 
So to wrap up, let's go back to that roadway into the sunny future. Um, we've got the signposts there of things that have already been done and collectively they're starting to become significant. There's a long way to go and the government recognises that. And when I first heard that the government was doing this, I was very pleased. In February, the minister announced that the government is committed to producing a whole of economy, low emission strategy for the COP26 meeting of the, of the United Nations IPCC in Glasgow, which was going to be this year, of course, but is now being postponed to next year. And so that's a significant watch this space uh, strategy that will be the next, next very major announcement on our journey into the low emissions future. So Ken, that's it. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Wonderful, Alan. Thank you very much for taking us for that little drive along the uh, road into the future uh, and uh, for the excellent uh, signposting along the way. That's always useful. Uh, so as uh, we did uh, earlier with the initial technology investment roadmap discussion paper, we have a panel of experts to uh, present their perspectives. Uh, this time uh, we have almost the same panel as before, not quite. Uh, we have one addition, that's Llewellyn Hughes. Uh, and our panel uh, will now uh, provide some commentary on the uh, technology investment roadmap, uh, low emissions uh, technology priorities. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Patrick Hartley. Patrick is the leader of CSIRO's hydrogen industry mission. He's responsible for developing the strategy, the structure, the operating model and the partnerships that will underpin a major new research initiative which is proposed uh, for the launch in mid-2020, which we've already heard about, haven't we, Patrick? Uh, and uh, this will drive uh, research, development and demonstration projects aimed at uh, scaling up Australia's domestic and export hydrogen industry. So over to you, Patrick. Thanks, thanks Ken, and, uh, and thanks also, Alan. It's a great pleasure to follow you once again. Uh, I seem to spend a, uh, quite a few talks doing that, but that's, uh, that's, that's very good. A tough act to follow, as always. Um, so yes, as Ken, as Ken mentioned, I'm leading, um, leading our hydrogen industry mission at the CSIRO, and uh, that obviously has a very strong focus on one of the one of the uh, priorities from the low emission technology statement, hydrogen. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about hydrogen in, in a moment. But uh, yeah, uh, Ken's really asked me to outline some high level reflections on the low emission technology statement now that we we have it in hand. Um, and in doing that, I should first disclose that uh, CSIRO really. Uh, made a, a, a big contribution to the development of the uh, of the low emission technology statement in a number of ways, uh, and that, um, from from my perspective in particular, included uh, a lot of the hydrogen cost modelling, uh, which informed the H2 under two stretch goal, um, and um, yeah, basically we see that that stretch goal as as a reflection on the strategy on on the statement, I guess, as as broadly consistent with where where we see uh, hydrogen uh, the hydrogen cost trajectory going. Uh, and it's particularly consistent, I guess, with our earlier work, which we presented in the uh, in the National uh, um, Hydrogen Roadmap in 2018, where we saw a we saw a progression towards around about two dollars fifty uh, for uh, over the next uh, decade uh, for hydrogen cost. And so, two dollars versus two dollars fifty is a is a stretch goal, and uh, and I think it's a realistic stretch goal because it really um, uh, we we know from that study and and, and subsequent studies that uh, that applications. For hydrogen really do start to come online. Uh, a broader range of those applications come online as that cost gets to that uh, gets to that level. So, um, so given, uh, as I said, given given my role as leading the hydrogen industry mission, it should be no surprise that I certainly see clean hydrogen as a technology development opportunity for Australia. Um, however, I will turn briefly to the overall uh, uh, package of priority challenges. Uh, the, the other. Um, uh, um, yeah, the, prior, the priority opportunities. Uh, and we certainly see uh, in CSIRO, we would certainly see them as, uh, pardon me, uh, we would certainly see them as, uh, as, as potentially important and, and worthy of support from a technology investment perspective. And in fact, we do have uh, active research efforts across CSIRO in, in virtually all of them. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, supporting new industries to transform raw, raw mineral commodities into higher value products using low emissions approaches. Uh, and uh, and uh, activities such as uh, um, value adding products uh, using new technologies uh, working on CCS, uh, electricity systems modeling and grid integration technologies, uh, all of which are really um, contributing 
uh, new ideas, new technology to that uh, to that goal of reducing emissions technology, which is of course what this statement is about. Um, however, certainly would note that the intent that this list uh, of technologies uh, is, is, you know, from the statement is not intended to be static. Uh, so, so really support the intention of ongoing review, uh, which is of course a commitment that's made in the low emissions technology statement to review that list regularly. Uh, and this makes absolute sense since uh, one thing one thing we know in science from the science world is that uh, game-changing technologies can appear at very short notice from left field. So we do need to remain flexible enough to embrace them when they do. And uh, so that ongoing review and refresh of the, uh, the statement will be very important uh, as, uh, as things uh, move forward. Um, returning to hydrogen, uh, the roadmap speaks of the hydrogen export, uh, export opportunity, of course, and that is also something of a focus for our technology development in CSIRO. Uh, particularly from the perspective of using ammonia as a clean hydrogen carrier for hydrogen export, uh, but also in the many other technologies uh, that we're, um, that we're uh, um, developing in, in the hydrogen space, be they around hydrogen production technologies, hydrogen processing technologies. Uh, and of course, the work that we do outside the technology areas, be they in, the, in things like environmental impacts and social license to operate issues. Um, so, um, as, as noted in the LETS and, and by many others, uh, export is not the only, uh, the only game in town. We're, we're increasingly of the opinion that building domestic markets for hydrogen will be a very important stepping stone uh, to that large scale export opportunity, uh, particularly since we need to really move to scale up the production and we're going to need domestic markets uh, uh, to, to, to enable that. Uh, and so on that topic, I'd really like to note that a domestic clean hydrogen industry can actually act as a real enabler of many of the other priority technology priorities, uh, such as uh, uh, the use of hydrogen to displace fossil fuels from steel making, for instance, and, and potentially is, uh, using hydrogen as, a, as an energy storage and grid balancing, uh, grid load, um, grid balancing uh, uh, technology opportunity. Um, and uh, I can tell you from the international perspective uh, that yesterday I flew on virtual wings to Qatar uh, to discuss uh, amongst a small group of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of experts from around the world uh, the development uh, development of their hydrogen strategy uh, and basically everything we've seen in our national hydrogen strategy and in our low emissions technology statement is very consistent with the analysis that was presented at that discussion so uh, i think uh, i think we can take comfort that we're not uh, we're not uh, seeing we're not, we're not inventing this uh, on our own it's uh, it's very much a, a shared view and um, with that i'll hand back to you ken Terrific. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our second panellist, uh, Dr. Liz Ratnam. Uh, Liz is uh, part of the ANU College of Engineering and Computer Science, where she holds a Future Engineering Research Leader Fellowship. Uh, and uh, she joined the faculty there in 2018. Her research interests are in the development of new paradigms to control distribution networks, with a focus on creating a resilient carbon neutral power grid. Over to you, Liz. Uh, many thanks, Ken, and um, I think I'm off mute now. And um, um, good afternoon, all. Um, just give me a moment while I set this up. Um, and many thanks for the warm welcome and introduction. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss electricity in the context of the low emissions technology statement. Ooh, and let me... Okay, and so in the context of the roadmap, there's three key points I'd like to focus on today. Um, one is ways we might evolve the roadmap into the future. Two is opportunities with regards to playing to our strengths. And three is ways that we might build new industries supporting growth opportunities, um, job opportunities. Okay, so now let's look at ways we might evolve the roadmap. First, let's take a look at the language for the stretch goal for energy storage, specifically electricity from storage for firming under $100 per megawatt hour. This would enable firmed wind and solar at pricing at or below today's average wholesale electricity price. Now, let's look at the slide to the right, courtesy of Mark Williamson, Executive General Manager of the Clean Energy Regulator. So if we look at the trends of renewable capacity delivered over the period from 2016 to 2020, and we see that rooftop solar, which is shown in yellow, is growing much faster than utility scale solar, which is shown in orange. And we know that firming technologies, that is energy storage, um, are needed close to the generation store um, source. For example, rooftop solar 
that's residential battery storage, for example, or community energy storage. Specifically, we need the distributed storage to back the rooftop solar or co-located um, storage to back the utility scale solar or wind. Otherwise, we might need some investments to expand the poles and wires that might be needed to, to move the energy from the solar to the, the storage, which, uh, in which case it could drive up our electricity prices. So we, we want to co-locate the, the generation with the, the energy storage as much as possible. Okay, so in terms of looking ahead in ways that we might evolve the roadmap, we might want to consider the development of control and automation technology for supporting the deployment of energy storage for firmed wind and solar. Specifically, control and automation technology is the brains behind how we operate the energy storage to firm wind and solar. In more detail, control and automation technology uses sensors that provide data to inform decisions on how much storage should be dispatched at any point in time in order to keep the lights on, providing a secure and reliable power supply. So under the banner of control and automation technology, let's consider the technologies outlined below. Here we've got smart meters, which are our sensors, which are inputs to our controller or our brain. Um, we have energy storage, solar PV, wind turbines, smart appliances, inverters, demand management systems, which we can all consider as actuators. That is the, the thing that the controller um, turn, um, gives decisions to, for example, to turn on or turn off. Um, and so the, the controller is, is the brains behind all of these technologies that enable us to keep our lights on. And so energy management systems are one form of this control and automation technology but these alone did not keep the lights on across the whole entire grid. So now let me touch on additional opportunities that we might want to consider in the context of our strengths. So the enabling technology of control and automation is used in high tech systems around the globe. Um, for example, aeroplanes, autonomous cars, manufacturing processes, and most importantly, the control room where operators look at the state of the electricity grid and make decisions every day in order to keep our lights on while operating and maintaining the poles and wires. So in terms of playing to our strengths, might I be a bit cheeky here and say that we have two Australian universities that are ranked number 13 and number 18 in the world, respectively, in this field of control and automation. And so now looking ahead um, at ways to build on industries, um, might I suggest um, in that context that we might consider things like having funding schemes for multi multiple horizons, supporting different levels of technology readiness, and that we support startups with grants for technology transfer from universities where we have this, this expertise. And also the third thing I'd like to um, put out there as uh, something to, to potentially consider is, um, looking at uh, developing a pipeline of graduates with the skills and expertise needed to grow um, the industries and businesses in this space. Okay, so I think, um, thank you. And that's my pitch for control and automation technology. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Liz, uh, for pointing out something that maybe needs attention uh, in the lead up to the second low emissions technology statement. Uh, we now move on to uh, Dr. Llewellyn Hughes. Uh, Llewellyn is an Associate Professor in the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy, and he's also the Associate Dean for Research in the College of the Asia and Pacific at ANU. Uh, he focuses on the regulation of natural resource markets and the political economy of climate change. Dr. Hughes joined the ANU in 2014. Uh, prior to that, he was at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. He received his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and holds a master's degree from the Graduate School of Law and Politics at the University of Tokyo. So over to you, Llewellyn. Thanks, Ken. Um, and thanks also to the speakers. Uh, really terrific to be part of this and to hear um, uh, everyone's views uh, on the, you know, what I think is pretty exciting, and that is the development of technology, uh, a low carbon technology roadmap for Australia. Um, I know there, you know, there are a huge number of issues to discuss here, you know, around the relationship between the roadmap and deployment targets for Australia, its role within Australia's broad uh, decarbonisation uh, mission. Um, uh, and uh, others, uh, I think, are touching on those issues. So what I wanted to do was touch on 
a couple of different uh, issues that I uh, that I found really interesting and engaging with the roadmap. Uh, the first of those uh, has been mentioned briefly by uh, both Liz and Patrick, and that's about the the global component of the the technology roadmap. You know, as I as I was reading it, um, you know, it really struck me that international strategy, Australia's place within these technology markets, is really core to the strategy as it's been developed. The strategic intent uh, noted at the outset of the document is uh, in part for Australia to be internationally competitive in order to, as it says, secure continued prosperity for Australia in a low emissions global economy. The roadmap says that the government's going to enter into international partnerships to collaborate on priority technologies. And indeed, we may see this beginning to happen with the joint Australian and German uh, feasibility study which has been uh, proposed to look at trade and investment between Australia and Germany. If you look at the stages uh, between early technology development through to deployment, uh, stage three notes that you know, Australia needs to gain an understanding of its technological needs, but also its competitive advantages. And stage four says that priority technologies should be identified according to our competitive advantage. Really interestingly, um, you know, the, the, the technology uh, statement uh, uh, also mentions Australia's uh, experience in the solar photovoltaic market, where it's been, you know, played an extraordinarily important role in technology development. But many of the manufacturing benefits associated with that technology development, um, uh, you know, are, are actually core components of some of our leading module manufacturers globally located in China. So it's really um, interesting, and I, I wanted to highlight um, the the importance uh, of that. Um, you know, one of the one of the kind of difficult issues here is that for these early stage technologies that are in tradable sectors, when the government might choose where to invest, if those international markets are going to be particularly important in driving demand, because as the roadmap says, Australia's market itself is not big enough to play a key role in demand pull uh, to you know push costs down then we're really going to need to have a very good sense of what's happening in those markets. Let's take the example of Japan, where, where I do quite a lot of work. Part of the reason, Alan, forgive me if I'm wrong, uh, that Australia developed the hydrogen roadmap is because Japan itself did uh, and said that that was a direction it was going to go for you know, a variety of reasons associated with its loss of nuclear, for example. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at other areas, for example, in ammonia, as we've mentioned, which is talked about as a potential future area for investment, you know, Japan's looking uh, at, um, at you know, burning uh, green ammonia uh, in uh, its, its thermal coal plants up to 20%, actually, of the fuel load in order to lower emissions from its, its fuel sector. There's quite a bit going on there. And um, it's incumbent on us that if we're going to be relying on those kinds of decisions being made in those markets to understand how they're progressing in the, in the medium term uh, as well as the long term. If you look at Japan's fuel cell strategy, for example, They've got a target uh, of selling 200,000 fuel cell vehicles by 2025 and 800,000 by 2030. Now, today there are 3,000 of them on the road. And at the end of 2019, there were 112 hydrogen refueling stations across Japan. So really there, I think they're really struggling to try and hit the kinds of targets that we're saying are uh, informing our decisions about which key technologies to invest in. And so I think in addition to thinking about our own capabilities, we also really have to have a good understanding of what market demand is going to look like as a function of other roadmaps and other countries' uh, industry policy and industry strategy they're developing, if we're going to want to, uh, want to be able to get this right, given the way um, things have been put together. The, the second point uh, I wanted to uh, briefly touch on was the issue of governance. So when I look at the roadmap, it looks to me as a version of what we might call, you know, mission innovation. Um, you know, the basic idea is rather than uh, supporting entrepreneurialism through general R&D tax rebates, uh, for example, that the government sets a broad direction, which is associated with a social goal, and then supports innovation in that direction. And here, obviously, that's about decarbonisation. And then the question becomes how we're going to track the performance of those public investments over time. And the roadmap makes some very, very important remarks about those governance issues moving forward, and particularly issues around monitoring, around transparency, and around impact evalu evaluation. You can see that other countries go about this quite differently. So Japan 
have standing committees which sit within departments and are made up of expert committees with both public and private membership. And they continue to analyze on an ongoing basis performance within a particular technology space. The UK set up the Energy Technologies Institute as a public private partnership beginning in 2007, which is actually sitting at a university, but it had a budgetary appropriation for about 50 million pounds a year and presented a different kind of model for that monitoring and evaluation exercise. Germany has got the Expert Commission on Energy for the Future Monitoring uh, Processes, as it's called, at least in English, that supports the German uh, federal government. And actually, actually uh, Andreas Löschel, who we know in Australia and at the ANU, um, plays a key role in that. It supports the department, um, and it also is supported by the research community to do, to do the legwork around impact evaluation uh, as well. So it was very heartening for me to see that monitoring impact evaluation and transparency as, as a core part of, of its roadmap, because obviously it's really important for issues like regulatory capture. The part that's missing and that we're looking forward to, I think, for 2021 uh, is what that uh, impact evaluation component is going to look like. Because we do have a structure for funding, which is centered on the existing funding bodies we have in Australia, ARENA and, and uh, CEFC. We've got annual statements being put by the Minister to Parliament uh, to, to help track how things are going over time. We've got strategic statements being released by an advisory council, which Alan mentioned a moment ago. But what the roadmap tells us is in time for the 2021 statement, we'll have an understanding of what that robust impact evaluation component is going to look like. From every other country, it looks like you need to do some institution building. That's not something you can do with a few people, but you really need to have a fairly substantial amount of governance and work behind that assessment of international markets and domestic technology developments over time. So that, that, that's a key thing to, I think, watch for moving forward. Uh, and thank you for Terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Llewellyn, for that uh, perspective on uh, both governance and uh, the need to keep uh, ahead of uh, the curve in technology by looking at uh, the demand in our consumer uh, partners in uh, international trade. Uh, now is uh, the opportunity to hear from Anna Skarbek. Uh, Anna is uh, CEO of Climate Works Australia. Uh, which is an entity uh, which uh, lives within the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And the aim there is to bridge the gap between research and climate action and accelerate the transition to net zero emissions in Australia, uh, as well as uh, in the region. And, uh, and uh, I note that uh, Anna is also the non-executive director of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. So she has a, a clear role to play in this uh, roadmap process and was a founding director from 2012 to 2017. So over to you, Anna. Thanks very much, Ken. And yes, I was on the CFC board for its first five years. And so I'll focus my remarks particularly on how investment programs can um, help boost the deployment uh, perspective that Llewellyn mentioned, and particularly the need for demand side focus in investment and in policy. So um, certainly the overarching comments about the low emissions uh, technology statement is that it's directionally correct. Um, and it's important that it's complemented by demand focus and investment, procurement commitments and policy support. So this can be achieved by the mechanisms already mentioned in the paper. So um, Alan Finkel mentioned the government's commitment to produce a long-term strategy in the lead up to next year's Paris Agreement. And that can be a place for additional policy uh, commitments and contributions by the Australian government. And also the way that the investment is deployed can um, be focused more acutely on the demand creation side. Um, Llewellyn mentioned the push-pull and I, I want to come back to that. A lot of the discussion in the in the tech investment roadmap paper, the, uh, the low emissions technology statement, is on the what you'd call the push side. So focusing on the supply of the technology and the costs of um, uh, developing the technology and putting it, making it available for use. But we know that deployment or the pull side of pulling it into the market is what can also help bring costs down. So it's the multiple use 
uh, multiple production runs, competition for um, acquiring the demand and therefore supply and demand. So push and pull coming together is where we've seen greatest success. We certainly saw that during um, my term on the CFC um, and reverse auctions are a very effective investment program approach that we've seen mostly applied in relation to electricity generation, such as the large scale solar round during my term on the CFC board when, when they partnered with ARENA and over the course of 18 months stimulated an investment round for 10 large scale solar farms and the cost per megawatt halved in that time because of the competitive pressure and the opportunity for multiple consortia to bid for multiple successful uh, winning opportunities to deploy, not just a single asset at a time. And we're seeing that approach again deployed with hydrogen, the recent round with ARENA and CFC, which was oversubscribed. So that led me to a second point, which is about the scale and pace needs increasing. Um, and I base those remarks on ClimateWorks' research into Australia's pathways to net zero emissions, and that indeed being the commitment of the Paris Agreement. Uh, our research shows Australia has multiple pathways to achieve that, but um, we are not, uh, Australia as an economy is not yet tracking its emissions to be in line with a net zero emissions trajectory. And the technology is available to do so, but the scale and pace of its deployment will need increasing. So this will need deployment not only of the technologies prioritised in the low emissions technology statement, but also of the technologies noted in that paper as mature and as emerging. And indeed the government recognises that in its document and, um, and, and certainly acknowledges that demand can be catalyzed through activities such as offtake agreements, procurement, incentivising the uptake through ARENA or CFC. So I'm interested in increasing the focus on that, that we will need uptake of all the technologies named in the paper, not just the four that have been prioritised. So um, indeed we've looked at uh, deployment goals as a as a guide. I, I note that the government's paper acknowledges that uh, the government's preference is to not mandate any deployment goals or, or mandate the use at a certain volume of any of these technologies. Um, given that position, we can work in the meantime with the investment that's available and hopefully investment that's increased in future years and leveraging private investment using CFC and ARENA and also working with the states. So there's an opportunity through the Commonwealth state deals. There's been one MOU signed with New South Wales and the Commonwealth. Uh, there's an opportunity for other states to partner with the, the Commonwealth, also to partner with the CFC and ARENA directly and use the investment that they can deploy through their own budget programs and CFC and ARENA to create the effect of demand signals and procurement or offtakes. So being more sophisticated with what might be a traditional grant round, what's considered on the push side as a subsidy, often what the private sector is seeking is in fact a risk sharing. So an offtake agreement is indeed that, it's a contract that removes some of the risk of the demand being, being there. Another way of doing that is contracts for difference, where if we take hydrogen, there's the cost of the electrolyzer, but there's also the cost of the electricity that's used to produce the hydrogen through that technology equipment. And when we, when we think about a push investment um, program, which, which this statement has largely focused on, pairing it with a pull investment program that can create the user um, arrangements, the demand side, also with a way that can help share some risk. Um, we're certainly seeing that that's uh, what's considered more attractive for private investment to be deployed at scale. And given the urgency of the emissions reduction task globally, it's the at scale response that we need. And so our, our uh, Climate Works' response, which is on our website to the paper, looks at how to catalyze a supply chain scale response, such as those large scale solar rounds that I discussed or the, or the hydrogen rounds recently. Um, crafting, using the reverse auction concept and looking at it even in relation to hubs. There was the name for, there was the reference of one regional uh, hydrogen hub in the paper, whereas a sort of a competitive round of, of multiple hubs um, can, can catalyse a supply chain response where you get a, a larger likelihood of more bidders, more consortia, and you start to embed local investment in 
um, in, 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 in often what's considered the soft time of term sheets between those parties, agreed risk sharing between the consortia, established sales force, established channels to market, all that stuff actually takes investment. And what a well-designed goal-oriented investment round focused on demand can do at supply chain level is offer enough demand as the off-taker, if it's government being the buyer, um, or if it's CFC and ARENA in a, in a risk sharing sort of contract approach, um, offer enough demand that you get a supply chain scale response, so multiple consortia. And then once they've done it once, cut the first cookie, as uh, the chair of the CFC used to say in my time, it's much easier for additional private sector players to replicate and for those initial winners to repeat without necessarily needing the subsidy round the next time around. So I'm certainly looking for uh, what comes next from this statement. Um, there's a lot that can be built on, but it's urgent that that building be done um, and that we've got this next year where there'll be the long-term strategy and another opportunity for another statement. And I would look to see a lot more commitment on demand side and hopefully a commitment on scale and that scale, not just on demand side, so the procurement and offtake, but also scale even in this early stage investment round. So um, obviously it's COVID times and there are large stimulus budgets being developed around the world. Australia is lagging in its share of clean technology investment as a percentage of COVID stimulus investment. Um, competitors uh, in, in Europe are spending between 20 to 30 to 50% of their um, stimulus investments so far on clean technology, green recovery measures. Um, in Australian dollars, in the UK, it was about 16 billion or 32% of their um, COVID stimulus budget. In France, it was about 50 billion Australian, and it was about 34% of their budget. Germany, also 50 billion, which was about 20% of their COVID budget. So there's a real scale question if Australia wants to be an international leader as indeed was the vision expressed in the paper. Um, and uh, I certainly support uh, that vision and Australia's potential to play that leadership role. And I, I hope uh, that the step up can be made um, so that Australia can harness that potential and also um, reduce our collective risk um, of remaining a high emissions country. Might leave it there for the discussion, Ken. Terrific. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, so yes, now let's uh, start the uh, the discussion. And I notice Alan's been taking lots of notes, so you may wish to respond to some of these comments. But um, maybe uh, just to start off with, uh, Alan, um, it's clear, I think, from a number of the speakers here that although we're talking about a technology investment roadmap, uh, which is clearly, uh, you know, focused on science and engineering, aspects that uh, that social and human sciences also play a role in this. It plays a role uh, in understanding, uh, you know, the human behaviour of, of demand, the geopolitics of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the global scene, uh, and also the development of market uh, mechanisms that will help uh, move this transition along uh, rapidly and, and uh, allow these technologies to hit the ground running. So just perhaps a view, Alan, on the role of, uh, of these other disciplines in helping the technology roadmap uh, hit the ground running? It's a very difficult question, Ken. Um, there's no doubt that building the demand that Anna's talking about um, requires everybody to play a role. Uh, it, it's actually frustrating when people do surveys and they ask people they're interested in reducing their emissions profiles and the answer is always yes but when you actually when the rubber hits the roll, road and it's a question of how much are they prepared to add to their electricity bill or to their expenditures through a tax uh, very quickly they don't want to be part of it and how we can come up with systems that provide sufficient reward to consumers for actually going a little bit further themselves because that demand that we're talking about um, is the totality of millions of consumers. It's not just one big company. That big company's got customers, and a lot of their customers are companies who have other customers. So in some countries, the psychology of this, like in Denmark, is um, really well advanced. In Australia, we've got a long way to go. The government's got a difficult pathway 
to navigate where it's got to show leadership in these low emissions uh, approaches, but it's also got to bring everybody along beyond just talk to actually being willing to commit. And currently the approach or the approach that's embodied in the low emissions technology statement is to win people as participants by taking the economic pain out of it. And you can do that by subsidizing from general revenue, which is done, for example, in the Climate Solutions Fund and the ERF, or by investing to co -invest, or investing to co-invest with uh, developers to drive those new technologies down a cost pathway that they become very, very attractive, very, very attractive. And some of them will get there quite quickly. We're, we're very optimistic about hydrogen reaching the point of being competitive uh, with diesel and petrol for trucking and trains and shipping. Um, and in terms of building demand, which is going a bit off your question, uh, one of the areas that's been coming up, up a lot recently is using ammonia for shipping as the fuel of choice going forward for the whole, ultimately for the whole of the international uh, merchant fleet. I, I actually think that large applications like that will probably provide the demand that will drive the cost down, that will make it much more practical to bring people along. Your question was really, can we or should we be investing in the research, the sociological research, the, the human research that will help to advance them? Well, of course we have to, but researchers like your colleagues have to come up with the right applications that will attract the interest of the funding mechanisms mechanisms we've got. So we've got in this area, we've got ARENA and CFC, which we don't have in non-energy areas, but most of the um, social values type research is funded by the ARC or the universities themselves. And that's always on the basis of investigator driven or investigator initiated uh, research applications of a very high caliber. So it's important. Um, it's not the focus of what the low emissions technology statement is doing. Its statement is to provide benefit. Its, its goal is to provide benefits to consumers by lowering the cost of energy, electricity and substitutes for gas um, so that they want to participate in this. The alternative approaches at this stage in this country, I think are gonna to have to be driven by smart researchers putting forward the right grant applications, going out and showing to government and others that you can make a difference if you understand those social values. Good, thanks, Alan. Uh, and uh, a question now about how the, uh, the uh, if you like, the, the uh, hierarchy of technologies uh, gets evolved over time. So uh, you mentioned uh, that, you know, you've got this group of mature technologies, and this includes uh, wind and solar, which are being heavily invested in by industry at the moment. Um, but in some sense, uh, that sends a bit of a signal that uh, solar and wind are kind of done. Uh, whereas we know that actually that's not the case. So maybe the previous generation of solar and wind are done, uh, but this uh, is a constantly changing landscape. And uh, just to give you an example, uh, the, uh, the current generation of solar cells, which now dominate the international market, were in fact developed by Australians, by Andrew Blakers at ANU and uh, Martin Green at UNSW and their colleagues. Uh, but that was uh, 30 years ago. So, so that was very way uh, down the uh, technology pipeline when that first happened, but now it dominates. And the next generation of solar cells are being looked at now, things like perovskites, uh, uh, tandem solar cells and the like. Uh, and, and indeed, this is going to be even more important because uh, as the cost of the panels, uh, the modules themselves are driven down, it'll be the balance of plant that actually dominates the cost element. So any improvement in uh, efficiency is going to make solar even cheaper. And again, this feeds into hydrogen. Uh, we've uh, done uh, work at the ANU where we looked at the main uh, cost drivers to achieve $2 a kilo in hydrogen, and they basically boil down to the cost of electrolyzers, but also the cost of renewable energy. So, uh, so uh, how do we then build into this system uh, the ability to uh, leapfrog uh, certain technologies up into the priority list, such as next generation solar, uh, from the uh, the lower echelons of the hierarchy. 
So it's, it's really important not to see the government identifying priorities as in any way saying the other things don't count. I think that the logic here is if you can invest in a handful of priorities, you've got a sufficiently small number that your money can make a difference. And that was the fourth filter that we had, that a government investment will help to make a difference. But everybody else benefits because there's a move towards low emissions technologies, there's the psychology of it, and there's the cohort of, or, or actually, let me call it the interactions between them. So green steel, green uh, zero emissions aluminium, deeply depends on the cost of electricity. It's the biggest single thing. And if you can get, you need to use renewable electricity, it's got to be really, really cheap. But when we're saying it's mature, two things. First of all, perovskites are new ways of achieving photovoltaic or solar conversion. Um, they're still being funded through ARC, through university funding, through CSIRO funding and through arena funding. So it's not as if they're being switched off. And the second thing is because they are mature technologies, industry is very well motivated to be even more competitive. So if you can build a plant that can take a couple of dollars per megawatt hour off the, your amortized cost of producing electricity, you'll do it. And it's a variety of things. It's not just the efficiency of the cells, it's the packing density. There's an Australian company called Maverick that does this prefabricated um, packaging of cells where they're concertina and they go out in the field and they just roll them out and they're actually placed really close to each other. They're cheap to deploy. They're using the uh, land area more effectively. The cable distances are shorter. Um, and they're motivated because there's a commercial return in taking the cost out of their deployment. So mature doesn't mean old fuddy-duddy. It just means it's at a different stage of its evolution and a stage to be well-respected. And I think there's massive opportunities for improvement. As you said, there's a lot of investment, billions and billions of dollars going into solar and wind in this country. And a lot of smarts are going in not necessarily at large scale to the panels themselves, but to the deployment technologies. We, we missed, as um, the Llewellyn was saying, I think we, we missed the opportunity to capitalize on the income of being the manufacturers and the royalty income uh, for the inventions from Andrew and from Martin. Uh, most of them are used royalty free around the world. Capturing it is really, really hard. But the government is continuing to invest through ARENA, CFC and all those other ones it's not as if the only dollars will ever be spent on those five priorities. They're just the lead for government attention. Very good, thank you. And uh, so I now turn to the audience uh, for questions. And uh, we've got a couple of questions around the, uh, uh, the uh, reduction in emissions that might uh, be expected to occur from these five priorities. Uh, a couple of the uh, uh, people in the audience uh, have mentioned that uh, the 250 megatons per annum the reduction that this might uh, create uh, is, uh, is a very large amount. It's about half, in fact, of the current emissions uh, in Australia. So they're wanting to know how this was calculated and indeed how realistic this might be just looking at the technologies that uh, are being considered here. So th there's been a lot of work that's been done by the department and through consultancies, and it was just impossible to get it all finished and it's being wrapped up over the next few weeks. And so that information will become public and, and put on websites. Um, but it's the, it's the combination of, um, you know, if you're investing in solar and wind to make hydrogen and ammonia for export, and by the way, that's 2040, it's not a 2030 mm -hmm. target. So it's a 20 year target. Not, not a close one, um, you, you are actually lowering your costs for solar and wind. You've got the storage to bring more solar and wind into the electricity grid and displace the existing fossil fuel uh, incumbents. So we'll be taking a lot of emissions out of the electricity grid. We'll be investing a lot into uh, green steel, which will be starting to come on board around that time. Green aluminium will be starting to come on board around that time and green hydrogen and derivatives, which have export potential as well. And so we're looking at, um, in a sense, what the reduction through not exporting what would have been a high, ex high emissions export and also the biosequestration potential of soil organic carbon, as well as above ground um, 
fire and sequestration. So uh, there is backing for all of that. Um, but keep in mind, it's a 20 year period. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be feasible in a 10 year period, but we do think it is feasible in the 20 year period. Does the, uh, the panel have any uh, comment to make on the, on the emissions uh, side of the uh, uh, technology statement? No, not at this stage. Okay, uh, let's move on to a couple of other questions then. A uh, question from John Soderbaum. Uh, John's asking about the, uh, the actual goals of these uh, priority areas. Um, and he, he asks uh, a very interesting question. So what happens if private sector investment isn't for forthcoming for one of the five priorities? what happens then in the roadmap process? Does that mean that government will still invest in that priority in the future or will it be taken off the priority list? Well, it would certainly put at risk the continued investment by government, that's for sure, because the main reason that private sector wouldn't be investing is that the technology is not evolving mm -hmm. as well as people thought. Um, as I said in my talk, it's a, it's a portfolio mm -hmm. and Look, if one of the five is not working out at all and it's taken off and over successive years through the annual low emissions technology statements, which are like milestone markers on the roadmap going forward, um, new technologies are brought in, so be it. You know, no one is saying this is the only way forward. We actually use the word adaptive. It's an adaptive approach. We are committed through that annual review that is the methodology will be developed over the next year, not over the next weeks. We haven't worked it out yet, but we're committed to having a robust uh, evaluation process. And if it's clear that one of those technologies is just not going to make it or it's not going to make it in Australia, it might make it overseas, then I would assume that slowly we would back out of that and move into something else. I can't tell you the answer, Ken, but it's not cast in concrete. What we are committed to or what we've advised the government, the government is committed to is not to do rapid policy, right angle turns or U-turns. It will be an evolving portfolio. Um, I think there's a good chance those five will continue for the long term. At this stage, we see them as very, very worthwhile. But anything is possible. And it just might be that international competition makes something that is otherwise really, really an important technology completely impractical for Australia. I hope not. But, it, you know, there's many reasons why things might not work out. You have to take a bit of a chance. Good. Thank you, Alan, for that. Uh, so we now might move on to a question from uh, David McEwen. Uh, so David's touching on this uh, issue of uh, uh, hydrogen demand and in particular looking at the domestic side of things. I think Patrick uh, talked to this point as well earlier. Um, so there are proposals to introduce hydrogen into the natural gas uh, network, 10% uh, uh, initially, but uh, then uh, there's a big jump uh, from there to 100%. So uh, I guess uh, the question, if I can summarise it from uh, David is, um, what is the view of the panel uh, in injecting hydrogen into the gas network uh, versus simply switching to electrification or uh, pure hydrogen alternatives at source? I guess that means fuel cell electric vehicles and the like. So uh, that's open to the, to the whole panel. And uh, I don't know, Patrick, whether you have a, a view on the tension between those two elements, but I'm um, happy to hear the panel's uh, views as well as Alan's. Oh, absolutely, and I, 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 uh, I would say it's not a tension; it's actually an opportunity. The, I, I think, and, that, and that's that's where the thinking is really going in this space now. I think uh, there's no there's no one right answer. Uh, I think uh, the opportunity for hydrogen to play a role in, in in many of the value chains that it can potentially play will 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 always be balanced with where electricity can play a role. I mean, Alan spoke about the electric planet in one of his recent talks, and and I think that's absolutely right. Electrify everything you can. Uh, and then look at uh, look at where uh, where hydrogen you know can play a, can, can add add value to that uh, in certain applications where electric electricity may not be may not be suitable. There's no doubt in we you know we're going to need combustion and heat uh, for a long time in both in industry and in uh, domestic applications. So I think looking at hydrogen in that application is entirely appropriate. But uh, equally well, there may well be a, a much larger role for electrification to to, to reduce that demand. Um, so it's really just about balancing what makes sense. 
Ken, shall I jump in on that? Sure, uh, certainly. I certainly agree with um, everything that Patrick said. I'd, I'd um, add two things. Um, one is that a 10% target actually is a phenomenal opportunity to build up experience on producing hydrogen. Ten, if 10% if of our reticulated gas in, in suburbs and cities uh, was hydrogen, we would need about a gigawatt worth of electrolyzers which is three or four times the annual global production at the moment. So it would be an enormous um, movement along the learning curve towards developing skills in safety and deployment and reducing costs. And it could be done with virtually no impact on the price of the gas to the end users. So it's, it's a valuable thing to do in terms of the roadmap building up the demand that Anna was talking about. Um, the other thing is it's, it's sort of horses for courses. So um, in some cities like in, or states like in Victoria, the winter use of gas is huge. And the studies that I've seen where they actually look at doing an electricity substitution versus a hydrogen substitution, uh, because of the extra electricity infrastructure that you would need, a hydrogen substitution is clearly less expensive than a wholesale electricity substitution. But that won't always be the case. But the reality is you've got a lot of stock there. You've got a lot of investment in, in, you know, in distribution pipelines and houses with central heating and gas cooking and, and gas hot water and things like that. And it takes a long time for people to turn around houses through renovations or demolishment and rebuild. So there's a lot of reason to give people a quicker solution to reuse what they've got by substituting their emitting methane with zero emissions hydrogen. So it'll be worked out city by city, suburb by suburb, but the reality is we can't jump into it too fast. A 10% substitution can be done without changing meters, without changing appliances, gives us a lot of experience and would take us probably till the end of the decade in any event. And so the decision as to where to go after that, does one make the leap to pure hydrogen uh, and keep the distribution networks in an individual neighborhood or does one make the leap to go to electricity substitution is a watch this space kind of decision. Very good, thank you, Alan. And uh, now we'll just uh, switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about uh, the, the investment element of this. Uh, and there's a question from Jenny Sinclair, uh, which reads, where do you think that the private investment to match the government funds will come from? Will this be existing energy firms? Will it be other sources? I don't know what uh, uh, Jenny's thinking of here, but I guess she's thinking of, I don't know, superannuation funds or other big investment uh, houses. Uh, and maybe it's an opportunity to bring in a discussion from uh, Anna and, uh, and Llewellyn about this particular aspect. Indeed, if Australia is to move down the pathway of being a renewable energy powerhouse for the world, the same way it's uh, already a powerhouse for the world in conventional uh, fuels, uh, where will the investment come from to uh, make the best use of that opportunity, which will absolutely dwarf the uh, the transition that the national electricity market is going to make? So. Uh, uh, I'll open that up for the panel for discussion. Sure. Look, there's an increasing volume of private sector investment that wants to align with the Paris Agreement goals. Um, uh, the, the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance is a club of trillions of dollars of uh, funds under management by financial institutions globally. You can see their members online. Um, another announcement yesterday by JP Morgan Chase in the US committing to align their entire lending portfolio to the net zero emissions goal by mid-century for the Paris Agreement. Some of Australia's banks have made the same commitment. Um, those commitments are still in their um, fresh stage of made the commitment, haven't yet mapped out the trajectory. So there's a bit of implementation steps to go. But once the commitment's made, you can be assured uh, there are staff tasked to work on that now. Um, what they'll... And, and certainly we find that's global and Australia is an attractive market. So when the CFC and ARENA did the large scale solar round, um, new international banks uh, partnered with some of the engineering and technology suppliers to become bidders in the, in the consortia who were successful. And so we know that 
that creating demand through that sort of structure attracts the investors. When Alan referred to the investment certainty, that's often a, a, a cry from the investor community. Often that certainty is referring to something like an offtake agreement or it's around the will the demand exist question rather than is there risk in this technology? And uh, for example, I've, I've heard often discussions in the, in the hydrogen space and perhaps Patrick or Llewellyn might jump in on this one, but saying that private sector are, are plenty are happy to take technology risk. They can do the due diligence on the equipment, the provider, are they gonna be around in time to prepare the stuff? Has it got a track history? They're good at doing that due diligence. But something like electricity price risk that's subject to an uncertain policy environment and, and some surprises along the way is something that makes investors nervous and pushes up the, the price of capital. So uh, there's risk and there's risk when investors look uh, into what the true costs are and what affects their appetite to invest in a much more committed and large scale way. I might uh, add something to that, Ken, as well, if that's okay. Um, just, yeah, just uh, ab absolutely right. And, and just in terms of who who is really investing in this space, in the hydrogen space, uh, it, it, it's 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 a combination. But there are you know very large global players in the energy energy uh, production and, and retail space that are that are really um, putting together these proposals, looking for those offtake agreements, and uh, and ready ready to ready to go. So it'll be. It'll be, you know, some of the some of the very deep pockets, uh, multinational pockets, uh, but also, of course, new technology, new 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 industry opportunities for technology uh, developers, etc., as well. And so. there's there's history indeed in Australia's infrastructure development. Uh, the LNG sector, which is of course now one of the world leaders, if not the the largest um, export sector for um, when Australia competes worldwide on that on that uh, product. About 30 years ago, the first major offtake contract was provided by the West Australian government, which helped catalyze the initial investment, which then led to the expansion of the sector. So it's certainly been a practice in the past, and I would hope we will see a lot more of it in the future in relation to low emissions technologies. Yeah, and I was gonna raise the example of LNG. It's a terrific example in that case, I think, um, you know, uh, to, to draw on. And you can see some similar dynamics in the hydrogen space today with the demonstration project that's been built in Victoria, for example. You know, I don't know if, you know, coal and CCS is, ne is necessarily the long-term pathway one would wanna go down for with hydrogen ultimately, also from a competitive perspective, perhaps, um, you know, as green hyd or hydrogen with renewables becomes more competitive. But, you know, there's a large consortium of, uh, you know, of Japanese investors who are investing in that project and hoping to move it onto a commercial basis. Um, you know, they've got very deep pockets that said, aside from the, the uh, you know, the financial side that, that Anna talked about. So I think there's no real concern over whether there's enough money to invest in these areas. So long as policy certainty exists, it's just so very, very important. Um, you know, I do quite a lot of work regionally in the offshore wind space. And, um, you know, and, and with companies I speak with, with, which are investing in the growing markets in Taiwan and South Korea and Japan, when they ask them what they're thinking about uh, in Australia, they say, oh, we're just, we're just not sure what's going on with the electricity market there. So we'll wait, wait to see. So I think, you know, again, to Anna's point that, you know, that, that policy certainty is, you know, really, really important in terms of, uh, you know, providing uh, an environment that enables that, that capital to come in. Ken, a few, couple of things for me. First of all, um, the rate of investment into solar and wind in Australia is just massive. Um, I, I think it was research that came out of the ANU uh, earlier this year that showed that 2018, 2019, and now ongoing in 2020, <coughs> solar and wind electricity is being invested in Australia at 10 times the international average, three times uh, Germany, we've got the highest per capita per capita rate of investment in solar and wind by investors. So right, yeah. there is genuine interest in Australia by investors in clean tech to do that. Um, to your question, is it always going to be traditional energy companies? The answer is clearly not. Um, it's not a hydrogen investment, but I, I just find it fantastic that Sun Cable, which is the very bold uh, and possibly quite practical um, intention to send an undersea cable to Singapore and a few other things associated with that is by a digital tech magnate and an iron ore mining magnate. Um, you know, so it's Mike Cannon-Brooks and Andrew Forrest. So 
the excitement around the opportunity of clean energy technologies or any clean technologies is drawing people from the non-traditional spaces for sure. But the most important thing is, Anna, you talk about these trillion dollar investment funds and JP Morgan and things like that incredibly important and I'm, I'm sure you're right once they've made the commitment they will come up with a pathway for their investment a plan for their investment but going back to yours and Llewellyn's and my comments are they going to invest in building demand or are they always looking in building new technologies for the supply side and I, I worry that most people want to jump in on the supply side and we're not seeing enough on the demand side. And that's why Japan hasn't met its targets for uh, hydrogen fuel uh, cars or, or other vehicles. We really got to focus on the demand. If they could invest in, in helping the manufacturers today of marine diesel engines to modify those designs to become marine ammonia reciprocating engines cost effectively probably at a loss in the you know in the first few ships that would build enormous demand so do whatever you can Anna to get them looking at demand 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 and a bit of demand and that's where government plays a role in helping private sector get over that cutting the first cookie hurdle but, you're right very large banks the mainstream banks they they they, they want to wait till something's not first of a kind and so something like a reverse auction program that said we, government, in partnership with Commonwealth, state, CFC, et cetera, wish to be the demand for five marine engines being refurbished and bid to us the minimum support you would need to do the refurbishment from a pot of maximum size X. That's how reverse auctions work doesn't need to be only for kilowatt hour type generation or megawatts of, of solar. It can be for a um, number of ship engines. It could be for the number of uh, low income households retrofitted for energy efficiency to a certain energy productivity improvement. You know, you could say, bid us the suppliers who can do X hundred homes per annum for four years in a row. And then you only get the bidders who worked out a delivery model that does it efficiently and they have this opportunity of essentially a, a, a grant, some sort of push part, the, the cash part, and some ongoing debt funding to allay the cost of their own investment internally in getting ready for that first cookie. That's often what it takes. That's what the first off-taker did in LNG. It, it, it's essentially the equivalent of being the first off-taker, is just being the first buyer, and, and government can then pull through all of that other money, but it doesn't step in in absence of that, we've found. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for your contributions to this discussion. We've uh, now reached uh, the end of our allotted time. Uh, we still have a lot of questions up there on the uh, Q&A, which uh, we'll endeavour to answer after the event. If you would like to simply email your question to energy.change at anu.edu.au, then we will pass this on to the relevant panel member and uh, hopefully you'll be able to get an answer uh, by early next week. Uh, we'll put that email address uh, in the chat for you to pick up more easily. Uh, but now uh, I'd like to just uh, say that uh, there will be a follow-up on Monday uh, to this discussion of the low emissions technology uh, statement. Uh, this will focus more around the carbon capture and use, uh, the CCS and the soil carbon storage side of things. Uh, it will be presented by the ANU Climate Change Institute. So that's Monday, October the 12th. We put the URL in the chat for you to, uh, to grab that. Uh, so we look forward to your participation in uh, that uh, follow on from this uh, deep dive into the low emissions technology statement uh, for uh, for this evening. Uh, so it uh, now just uh, rests with me to thank our keynote presenter, Dr. Alan Finkel, our panelists, Patrick Hartley from CSIRO, Liz Ratnam from ANU, Llewellyn Hughes from ANU, and Anna Scarbeck from ClimateWorks uh, for their contribution to the discussion this afternoon. 
Uh, we, uh, I think, had a very engaged audience of well over 200 people, uh, more than half of whom remained right to the end, so that's very good to see. Uh, and we look forward to uh, welcoming you at future Energy Change Institute webinars. Uh, please take a look at our website and you'll see the upcoming events. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at one of those events in the future. So thank you everybody in the audience. Thank you to the panel members. And thank you again to Dr. Alan Finkel. And thank you, Ken, for sharing it so well. Good, and I hope you have a good evening. Uh, I'd ask the panelists just to turn off all their mics and uh, we look forward to talking to you in the near future. Good night, everybody.